money supply, as you know, um, from the summary, and I embarrass you with the little introduction. Um, I was first exposed to the great insights that Robert can bring to this subject by a paper that he gave, which I'm not sure you published on now coins. No, the deal was I was going to publish it in the final. Oh, thing okay. For these well, like these little tiny little coins are surviving in great numbers from central India, and they've always been assigned to uh, an early period based on the names and some assumptions about the history. And he, there's a collection of this in uh, of this material, not a very big bundle of it, but um, sufficient number to do an analysis of the group in the British Museum collection. And he went back and looked very carefully at the, at the core data and basically redated all the material, which proved uh, quite conclusively, in my view, that uh, in the early Gupta period, there was actually a very high level of monetization, uh, certainly in central India. And that these coins were circulating and they were restruck. Um, and there was really rather a lot of money uh, circulating, contrary to the generally accepted view that the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries were marked by demonetization. Uh, it's very much, I think, in the spirit of our project as a whole, which is going back to material and looking very scientifically and carefully at the data sets, thinking about them, re-examining them, and coming up with a fresh sort of analysis informed by, of course, our interactions with each other in uh, neighboring fields. So, uh, <coughs> with that sort of prelude, I'm really looking forward to what he has to say today, <laughs> which I'm sure will be equally stimulating. And uh, I've heard that Gethin is going to respond to this. You're, you're a respondent today? So, yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's I'll, going I'll, to... Anyway, here's Robert. I'll yeah. leave it to him. Um, so we're... If anybody's familiar with this equipment and knows if there's a, a little pointer that moves the slides, that would be, be useful. Otherwise, I'm going to have to operate from a keyboard. It's, it's going to be from a keyboard, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, but you can also, I'll sit here and you can just say next. Okay, because I'm very good at that. For, right, we're being recorded, and so for technical reasons, we're going to have to operate two parallel versions of the presentation one on the screen behind me and one on the computer in front of me. Um, and so Michael is very kindly going to just move the, the slide forward yeah. when I do the same here. Um, <clears throat> and as the, the blurb on the website suggested, I'm going to be talking about a quantification problem, essentially the problem of how we count coins and what those counts mean in a wider historical context. And I'm going to be doing it in a relatively narrow focus and sort of exploring the methodological issues. And I'll say a bit more about what I'm going to talk about today. But I wanted to say, yes, both Daniel and Gethin are going to intervene at points in the talk to discuss particular um, aspects of interest. I've also got several other colleagues uh, who aren't from the project who've agreed to be here today. Um, Joe Cribb, who's the former keeper at Coins and Medals. Shalendra Bandari, who's the uh, present, uh, the, 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 you're called keepers at the Ashmolean, aren't you? Um, so currently senior assistant. Senior assistant keeper at the Ashmolean, who's, <coughs> uh, so, Joe and Chalendra are the two foremost experts on Oriental coins in the UK. Uh, and they will simply intervene when they think it's appropriate. Uh, Chalendra in particular has written quite a bit about the subject I'm going to talk about as well. And uh, Golrahim Khan from Peshawar University is visiting me at the moment and works extensively on coinage in Pakistan, uh, Afghan border area, particularly the material at Taxilla, which he's uh, written some of the standard treatments on. So, <clears throat> next slide. This, um, this book 
is essentially the stepping off point for all of this. This is early medieval Indian society by R.S. Sharma. R.S. Sharma is well known for his advocacy of a theory of feudalism in the mid to late first millennium. And he, one of the things that he believed happened with his advent of feudalism is that the economy was demonetized, that increasingly market exchanges were replaced by feudal obligations. You didn't work the land because you were given wages, you worked the land because you were required to by your overlord and you were tied to it. <clears throat> and this is from an introduction to a chapter he calls paucity of metallic coinage and he gives this little account. We are so obsessed with problems of political history that the obvious relevance of coins to economic activities does not bother us much. It needs to be stressed that coins so dramatically altered the nature of exchange and economic transactions that once in use they contributed immensely to trade, influenced the mode of taxation and established impersonal relations between consumers and sellers and between the state and its employees. Far-flung areas with different levels of economic development were bound together in a network of exchange relations leading social and cultural interactions often cemented by political domination. <clears throat> so Sharma is very interested in coins. And one of the things he does in this chapter is to try and demonstrate that after the Gupta dynasty, the number of coins in circulation goes down and therefore by extension, the amount of money. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> so a little bit just to make clear um, because there are limitations of expertise in how I, what I can speak to here. What this talk is about, <clears throat> how we can count and quantify numismatic data. Um, this is the kind of exceptionally dull, nerdy question that only numismatists really care about, and even only some numismatists, um, and, but is enormously important. Sharma is resting the history of the late first millennium on a count of the number of coins. So how we count coins matters. It's also about uh, this formula here, uh, MV equals PQ, which if you've done any economics class, you will know is the quantity theory of money. Fisher's formula for the quantity theory of money. Is it Q for Fisher? Um, Fisher. Q for Fisher. Q for Fisher. Um, the formula varies, <clears throat> but it's essentially a claim by economists that there is a relationship between the amount of money in circulation and the amount of market transactions and the value of them. Um, it's going to be about whether or not cross-regional trends existed in South Asia in this period. And it's going to be asking the question whether or not any of this means anything. What this talk is absolutely not about. I will not be offering a definition of feudalism or discussing whether or not feudalism happened. That is a much larger question. What I'm talking about here has a role to play in informing that sort of question, but it's not a question I'm qualified to discuss. I won't be discussing Marxist theory. That's partly because I'm not qualified to discuss it, and mostly because it's immensely dull. Um, I'm not going to be trying to answer the question if a profound social change occurred in India in the first millennium. What I will do, and I hope we can all be in agreement on this, I am going to assert that the evidence that we have available as historians at the end of the first millennium looks radically different to the evidence we deal with at the beginning of the first millennium. If you work primarily on the first centuries AD and you switch to working on the eighth, ninth century, the source material you encounter feels and looks different. Um, that I take as an empirical given for the whole talk. I take that to be the starting point for Sharma's hypothesis and that essentially what he's offering is an explanation for why that takes place. And his explanation is, there is a profound social and political change, so the sources change. Um, and I'm not going to be presenting any new theories about what happened. 
This is, at its core, going to be a talk about the methodology. Um, and the first thing that I'll do, uh, yeah, we can skip on, is actually do exactly what Sharma quite rightly criticised for, which is worry about politics. I have a whole bunch of maps here. Right? These are from uh, John Huntington's uh, site where he does maps of South Asia. This is a, these are base maps. Uh, if people can pass them round and maybe share between one or two of you. Okay. Uh, I have some nice thick marker pens right? you can play with. Uh, not enough for everybody, but do pass them round. <clears throat> and what I would like everybody to have a go at Right, in teams if you want to, is to draw a map on top of this base map, a political map of India in 550 AD. Right. In 550 AD, which states were where? Right. Which rulers ruled over what territory? Right. Um, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't do this myself, right? But I think this is always a useful exercise. So have a quick go. We'll give everybody five minutes, right, in which to have a go at this. Um, don't put your names on it. You do not have to accept responsibility for whatever borders you, you, you jot down, right? But. Um, partly for my own interest, I'm genuinely interested in what a group of people who are all specialists do with a map, right, in terms of borders for 550. Go on, have a go. <laughs> I think one of the reasons this is potentially interesting is because if you asked a Romanist to draw the borders of the Roman Empire in 150 AD, They'd be able to put a line straight on a map. They'd, they'd know which bits of territory were inside, which bits were outside. If you asked somebody who studies European history to draw a map of Europe in 1913, they'd be able to put the borders on. My experience of doing this task before is that often in South Asian studies, we just don't think in these terms. Okay. You can do this as teams, right? You don't all have to do it on your own if you feel self-conscious. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll restart there. I'd be interested to get the maps in. I see Shalindra has been very enthusiastic on his map. <laughs> um, so some people have given this a go in the past. Uh, well, recent past. Uh, this is a map by Thomas Lasso. Um, can we? Uh, covering 550, uh, which I think is completely wrong, but uh, it's it's interesting, and I think I think one of the differences between this by by an amateur essentially doing things for for Google, Wikipedia style things is the way that all those borders meet, whereas looking round the room, it's quite noticeable in this room that most of the borders don't. Right, that most of us don't think of these states as being rammed up against each other with modern style borders. This is a one from Wikipedia from 590. Um, right, so again, I think that that purple is somewhat optimistic. Um, and the next one is from about 600. Right, by Huntington himself using using this base map here. So that's a bit later. Yeah, that's a bit later. 550, the only one I could find for 550 was the first one I lost. So that little exercise out of the way, just to get everybody thinking about this period uh, in the sixth century. And the thing of course that matters in the sixth century is by about 500, the Gupta Empire has essentially collapsed as the hegemonic power of North India. Right? And nobody historiographically is writing about a hegemonic power again until harsher in the seventh century. So for this hundred years, in the literature, there's no 
hegemonic power. Um, and now we'll come to another one of those statements. Uh, that, that I said. This, this is empirically true. Uh, can we have the next slide? Um, the coin in the top left right, is not a Gupta coin. The coin in the lower right is. I would say that it's an empirically true statement that everybody in the room has seen more examples of the type of coin shown in the bottom right than they have of the type of coin shown in the top left. Right? Uh, I would say that's true even of the specialist numismatists. Uh, do either of my specialist numismatists want to disagree with me on that no, point? No. no? Yeah. Right? They are, I mean, both the ones are far more familiar. Far more familiar, right? <clears throat> the paucity argument which is the central argument underlying Sharma's recent restatement of his feudalism hypothesis works like this. I have seen fewer coins of this period type dynasty. Therefore, there are fewer coins extant. Therefore, fewer coins were made. Therefore, fewer coins circulate at the time that that coinage was made. Therefore, there was less money. Right. That's the paucity argument in a nutshell. The very first one of those steps is true. Right? I have seen less of those coins. Right? All of the subsequent steps do not follow. Right? Um, <clears throat> Sharma then uses it to make his main argument. He counts the number of coins that are in collections. This is the graph at the bottom behind me um, and okay this is going to take a little bit of thinking round my apologies for it um, the graphs go from oldest on the right hand side to newest on the left hand side okay which is slightly counterintuitive the first time I gave a presentation on this I drew the graphs that way round I have no idea why I did it but I then subsequently felt obligated to make sure all the other graphs correspond. So all the graphs work from oldest on the right-hand side to newest on the left. At the bottom are Sharma's counts of items in public collections. And you'll see lots of punch mark coins, lots of Kushan coins, a lot less of everything after the Kushans, a lot of Sultanate coins. Right? This is his argument. Right? There's a lot less money in the late first millennium. The graph on the top is from John Dale. But it was after Gupta's? I can't see. Uh, immediately after Gupta's, he has Ikshvaku's. Yeah. Um, so the graph on the top left is by John Dale. It is a counter of the number of hoards per year, right? This is per year of issue of the coins that are in the hoards, right? Um, in Uttar Pradesh. And again, the pattern's slightly different, but the, the basic shape is still there. There are lots of punch marks. There's a lot less of everything in between. It goes back up under the Sultanates. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, quantity theory. Right? The quantity theory works like this. The assumption is that the amount of mo the money in circulation chases the things you want to buy. So if there's more money in circulation, then the amount, the price of the things you want to buy goes up. Right? Um, and this observation was made by Europeans in the 16th, 17th century when they short, showed, uh, saw a dramatic rise in prices with the influx of silver from the New World. Right? Um, it can vary a little, right? So... If the coinage you've got, if the money you've got is moving around faster, that functionally increases the money supply without actually putting more money in place. So if you take your money and put it in a bank account and it doesn't do anything, then it's not really adding to the money supply. So this is known as velocity. It's the second term. So the money supply for economists is how much money there is and how quickly it changes hand. M for money, B for velocity. And the effect it has is dependent on how big the economy is, Q, and what the price of everything is. And so the assumption economists make is that 
basically people's behaviour stays essentially the same. Velocity doesn't change very much. Economies don't change in size very quickly. They, um, that's often modelled by taking the GDP of the country, which alters but doesn't alter very fast. So changes in money, in the amount of money, alter the prices. Right? So when you hear that a government is being reckless because they're printing money, this is the risk, inflation occurring. However, the ancient economy is not universally monetized. Right? Only certain sections of it are. And so what Sharma is doing, he's not doing this formally, he doesn't talk about the quantity theory, but what he's doing is he's assuming that in the ancient world, if the amount of money changes, the price doesn't have to alter. Instead, you could simply change the size of the monetized economy. A section of the economy could stop being monetized if the amount of money goes down, a section could become monetized if the amount of money goes up. And this is what is essentially positive, that the money supply is proportional to the size of the monetized economy. And when the money supply falls, the size of the monetized economy falls and is replaced with non-monetized transactions. Uh, land grants being a major part of the thesis. Um, and then next slide. And there have been some critique of his position. Shailendra might wish to say something because this is his article on the screen. Um, so Shailendra wrote a very lengthy article critiquing the basic underlying attempt to measure the money supply by counting the number of coins in collections. Do you want to say something? Yes, a little bit on uh, how the method of counting coins, because the first, there are what, what Sharma did was, as Joe knows, he came to the British Museum. Yes, and he came to the British Museum and he said he started counting trays. And uh, um, there were lots and lots of Gupta coins because Guptas are, have been collectible. Gupta coins have had good press. They look beautiful. They're gold. They have lots of nice imagery. And um, there was this classical, uh, slightly nonsensical paradigm about the golden age of Guptas. And so it was people collected Gupta coins more avidly. And uh, so as a result, there are lots of Gupta coins in museum collections. And whatever came after Gupta's was not really attributable. So it was not collected. Uh, collectors like coins that they can attribute and put it in little slots. So as a result, um, most of these sort of museum cabinets after Gupta's were empty uh, because they were not attributable coins. So what I tried to say in the article here, the first point was that lack of attributable coinage does not mean lack of coinage. Um, so if, if you can't attribute a coin, it won't be collected because collectors are not interested. And museum collections, therefore, are not really any empirical basis of the actual currency that was in circulation. Museum collections are formed with lots of biases. There is money bias, there is, there is you know, people who like certain coins. When Joe was the keeper, the Kushan collection increased. Uh, <laughs> um, and the rest did not. So, I mean, they haven't got any Mughal coins, for example, for eons. Because, you know, there, are no, there is no driver for this. There we are. So. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, so, later on, I will show you an example of a coin that the BM has no examples of. Yeah. So, so, so that, was, that was the main thing. So, uh, and that's why. The other sort of uh, things which, uh, which um, Robert will talk about, I, I, I hope, is uh, the, the kind of uh, inadequacy of numismatic knowledge about certain things. So, so you, you see on the coin the name of a Gupta emperor, and then you think that it is a Gupta coin, but in reality it is not. It is just a continuation of Gupta coins which sort of went on beyond the Gupta coin. So even in case of Gupta coins, there are lots of silver coins, for example, from Gujarat, which now we know with other methodologies are actually posthumous, but they all got sort of moved to Gupta cabinets uh, from the post-Gupta cabinets. So that sort of created a lot of um, skewed picture in terms of numbers represented within, within cabinets. Um, so that's, that, that is basically what my uh, point was saying point to say in that article was, and also then I presented certain ideas of if you actually want to quantify money in circulation, what are the methods available, 
can they be used? So that's where I stopped. So when when R.S. Sharma came to the coin room, I went round to the, the collection with him, and all the time he was counting the coins, I was saying <laughs> exactly the same things to him. So he had no excuse to do <laughs> because he'd been told. And there's a really good example we have in in the collection. When at that time we had one coin of Multan, which wasn't identified. Um, this is the, hin, hin, uh, the early Islamic um, emirate of Multan. Since then, I have seen about 5,000 examples um, through ports. And you know, so, but for that period, as far as we knew at that time, there, were, there was no coinage in Multan. Now, now we know it's an extensive coinage. Um, but it's just collecting practice in, in the southern Punjab and seeing people being collected in, in, the, in the, the northern Punjab, you know, Taxila, uh, people collecting coins. That, that was the reason. So, um, what I did or started doing early in, um, earlier this year uh, in relation to other things that were going on in the project, so I began trying to narrow the focus down on the general presentation Shalendra had made and look at just a very narrow period, but across the whole region. The problem with problem is numismists tend to work vertically through time. So we tend to pick a point or a series and follow it, right, without much regard for what's happening around the edges. And the kind of cross-regional pattern Sharma was identifying is only really visible if you cut across numismatic series. So I decided to look at the period from 500 to 600. This is the period immediately after the Gupta collapse. It's the very beginning of when all of this is taking place. And I tried to survey all the coins. So if you want to move on to the next slide. Uh, and these are the coins I, that I found, right? And I wrote, this down into a survey and I shared it with some of the other people on the team for them to respond to and this will literally just flick away behind us showing coins from the 6th century. Some of them might be very late 5th or very early 7th as Shalindra said we can't always date these things very accurately and the first and most obvious thing is there's quite a few of them right you know there's no absence of coinage in this period um, still going. <laughs> They're also quite varied. Right? Um, and the, I'll, I'll say something about this. These are not types. This is not one of every type. This is pretty much one of every dynasty right, from the 6th century. Um, in a few cases, two from a dynasty. But essentially, at that level, if we ran that presentation, it was one of every type, right? It would still be running uh, several hours from now. Uh, and this is pretty much what Challenger's just said, right? We know what the problem with counting public collections is, right? Scholarly interest, rarity, and aesthetics affect the number of coins that are there. Public collections are essentially a reflection of our interest in the source material, not the amount of the source material that's out there. Um, to put that in perspective, the, the Gupta coins that are extant, right, compared to those horrible little um, base gold examples I showed you at the start, where I said I've seen more of the Guptas than I have of those, the Gupta coins are probably an order of magnitude smaller in terms of extant examples, right? But nobody has seen more of the base metal types than they have of the Guptas. This brings us to, next slide, right here. <laughs> the fallacy fallacy, right? So, in formal logic, the fallacy fallacy is the assumption that because you have demonstrated somebody's method is incorrect, you have demonstrated that their conclusion is incorrect, right? Usually when your method is wrong, your conclusion is wrong because most of the time there are lots of possible conclusions 
and to pick from, and you're just picking one at random if your method's wrong, so you're probably going to be wrong. However, this isn't one of those cases. Either cross-regionally the money supply went up, or cross-regionally it went down, or it stayed the same, or there isn't a cross-regional pattern. So there's only basically four options. Right? So if they're all equally likely, Sharma has a 25% chance of being right, no matter how bad his method is. Right? So demonstrating that Sharma is wrong in his method is not the same thing as demonstrating that Sharma is wrong in his conclusion. And in his defense, right, because I think it's important, when he began writing about this in the mid-1950s, he did not base his argument on comments. Right? He based it on an analysis of other forms of evidence and assumptions drawn from Marxist theory. Right? And he subsequently claimed that the evidence that he encountered confirmed his opinion. Right? He sought to test his position by looking at the coins. So it's reasonably plausible. Maybe he's got the wrong method on the coins, but maybe he was right to begin with. Maybe, you know, if you measured the coins correctly, you'd get the same answer, right? Shalendra thinks you won't get the same answer. <laughs> but... Well, only as coincidence, I mean, uh, there are other aspects of his theory which, which one can max a little about. But... Yes. <laughs> um, also, in, in defense of Sharma, he openly states that his premise is Marxist. Yes. And yes. he says, here's the frame, and let's see if it works. Yeah. And he's willing to be, he's perfectly open to be refuted. No, and I think... And he does state yeah. his premises very clearly. Yeah. So I, and I think that's kind of important. We don't want this to be a Sharma bashing session. Right? Yeah. Sharma's work is very good. Right? And did Michael's right? He openly states what his assumptions are, and then he seeks to test those. We think the way in which he tested his conclusions about the coins is wrong, Right? but he is at least attempting to test it, right? so it's good practice to begin with. Uh, uh, thank you. So how can we count the number of coins? Well, we, we talked about collections. We can count hoards. Uh, this is what Dale does. Remember, Dale got the same, basically the same results, right? slight differences in nuance, but essentially the same results by counting numbers of hoards. Uh, we don't just have to count numbers of hoards. We can count the production of coins within hoards, how many coins produced in a particular period are found in hoards. We can count how many coins are deposited based on hoards. I'll come back to that one in a moment. We can count the number of dies. We can count how often coins are mentioned in other sources. We can count assemblages of coins from archaeological sites. Um, in principle, we can, ca we can measure things like velocity, commodity money, credit. These are all important. I'll return to those. So from this point onwards in the talk, this should be thought much less of as talk. Right? So if there's a point you want to make, shout out, and we will stop and discuss that point. Okay? Uh, could I make one point here? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's one uh, difference between the two uh, uh, findings of uh, Sharma and uh, Dale. Yes. It, 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 I mean, there, there may be others, but there's one clear one where there's a difference in Kushan. Yeah. Uh, because the hordes shown by Dale are much smaller, whereas the collections, according to Sharma, of Kushan is much higher. And that, of course, can go down to the uh, collectible uh, nature of Kushan coins. Um, but that's one clear difference I saw between them. It, it is, and I think actually that's that's a thank you for bringing that up because that's a point worth making that the different things that skew our data are quite complicated. That difference is not down to collecting practice. That difference is down to the fact that the place that has recorded its hoards in a systematic way is Uttar Pradesh, and Kushan coins are not made in UP, right? They're made somewhere else. So all of those coins are imports right, from somewhere else. So actually, the, the amount of coins in, in that is actually surprisingly high, given that the coins shouldn't be circulating there at all, because right, they're not mostly within the, the Kushan Empire. Um, so yes, but, the, but it's a good point that there are, there are differences in 
in the details of that count. Uh, the first one I'm going to do, because uh, it will give me an opportunity if we go on to the next slide, to talk about how robust the data is. Um, this is one of the intrinsic problems with any large data set. The underlying data has to be robust. How do you ensure that it actually is? Right? You know, short of physically checking every single coin right, to make sure the identification is correct. So what this is, is these are a set of, uh, a set of data collected by Chattopadhyay of inscriptions that mention coins from what he refers to as South India. And I think, given the general area, he's referring to everything essentially sort of Maharashtra and lower um, when he's collecting data. Now, he says that his data is not comprehensive, that he's collected as much as he can, but that he's probably missed things. And he does it to give the variety of different monetary terms that are operating in these inscriptions. Um, in the context of surveying South Indian coinage more generally. So he doesn't include it for this purpose. Um, what I've done is adapted it into a chart which shows how many, how many inscriptions mentioning a coin he records for each century down to the 10th century. And here's a point worth making. It's essentially the same pattern. Right? We get a little peak. So sort of end of the Kushans, Guptas, then nothing, then we get a huge rise afterwards. So details aside, the details matter and they are different, but details aside, we get the same pattern from counting the number of inscription, from inscriptions as we do from counting hordes, as we do from counting coins in collection. Right? Um, so, but, the point of this was to tell, talk about how robust this data is. Is he right? And this is where Daniel very kindly looked through the paper and told me last night, no, no, he's completely wrong. <laughs> on one right, on one particular inscription that Daniel happened to know. So basically it's just something that I happened to stumble into a couple of years ago and it rang a bell when I read it in, in uh, Robert's paper. Uh, it's an inscription that is supposed to say that a queen donated uh, some land to a Brahmin and in addition to the land, she donated a uh, gold bullion or yeah. gold bars uh, to him. Uh, and uh, I was looking at that inscription years ago for a different reason, but it sort of struck me as, as weird. Uh, and looking at the text, it seemed that uh, there was absolutely no mention of uh, bars of gold in the text. So basically what we have uh, is uh, in the Deonagari transcript for line 14, uh, those of you who can read Deonagari, you can see Subarna Shilakaya, uh, which the editor uh, called, I think, Dikshit, uh, the editor of the inscription, uh, emended or altered to Suvarna Shalakaya uh, and then claimed that it meant uh, bars of gold. Uh, now this is problematic to begin with because the, the inscription doesn't say Shalaka, it says Shilaka, which is quite different. Uh, even uh, the inscription contains lots of what you might call spelling mistakes or non-standard orthography. So, okay, let's assume this single word contains two spelling mistakes and shilak, uh, shalakaya had been intended. Still, then, the sentence wouldn't work. This, uh, uh, the syntax of the whole sentence would not be in good order. I've uh, put in transliteration below that uh, a bit of context for what we have uh, in the inscription. Uh, you can see, uh, or you can believe me, that is definitely a land grant. Uh, the entire context is about uh, land donation terminology. Uh, and what it says uh, is that she, this queen called Shyamalangi, uh, gave a land to, the, uh, to this Brahmin. Uh, there is nothing to say in addition, which is entirely uh, 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 something that's been added by the editor, that there's no in addition. Uh, the, uh, the land is the, the logical object of the sentence. Uh, the gold bars, even if we accept that it's gold bars, is not the logical object. Uh, it's, uh, it's a singular genitive form. 
uh, and you would expect uh, a plural genitive if you were to say it was 50 girded bars. Uh, so anyway, what I'm saying, uh, can we uh, oh, yeah, have a yeah, click? Slide. Uh, I just want to highlight, I think, uh, what is coming is highlighting the bit in the inscription uh, where you can see that uh, just before the yellow bit, uh, it is uh, uh, the reading of the inscription is not Dakshina, which was another assumption or another emendation by the editor. It's Dakshini. It is not uh, a Dakshina, uh, a, a, a sacrificial reward. It's Dakshini. It's to the south or to the right. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, it's Suvarna uh, Shilakaya, which was correctly read by the editor, but emended to something else. So, uh, can we go to the next slide again? Uh, what I'm suggesting, yes, okay, so we're just highlighting uh, the points I've been talking about. So, what it says is that uh, I've donated, donated something to the south of a pre existing Agrahara, of a pre existing uh, Brahmanical land. Uh, and I'm assuming, uh, now can we go to the next slide, that we need a much simpler emendation, uh, which is simply to emend Shilakaya to Shilakayam, uh, which would mean that uh, it's the name of a region. If you translate, if you don't emend Suvarna Shilaka to Suvarna Shalaka, then uh, you can just say it means golden rocks or something like that, which is very plausible as a name for a village or a spot or a stretch of land. And I think it's a much uh, less intrusive way of dealing with the text and gives us a much more logical result. So that about Goat Bullion. Where is this from? Uh, it's from a place called King Nibberdi, somewhere in Maharashtra. I was just mm -hmm. looking on the map to see where it is. I think it's close to Pune. Okay. So, yeah. I think it's in Pune now. The, could be. The, the, could be. The, yes. The, the plate. No, the plate itself is that oh, way. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I don't know that. Oh, is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That's Thanks. great. Thank you very much. So, what was the name of the inscription? Ah, now the reason that that particular inscription caught my eye is that is the, mm, depending on how you read the names of the kings involved and the names of kings in other inscriptions and the letter forms from somebody who analysed them in the 1930s, right, then that inscription is in the 5th century. So it was the closest one to the 6th century in the list that I had. So I looked at it more closely. And this is a good example of, of the robustness problem. The Chattopadhyay had depended on Dixit's reading and had therefore given its gold bars. So uh, this is not a coin. This is possibly a commodity money, right? Possibly just bullion, right? I'd read it and seen Subana and a term after it and gone to myself, ah, the editor has misunderstood and this is presumably a name and so this is a gold coin. The editor had excluded that possibility on the grounds that there were no gold coins that could have circulated there, right? but he didn't know enough about the gold coins so I was willing to disregard it. But as Daniel has just shown, right, we were both completely wrong and there just isn't a reference to money in the inscription at all. It's entirely falsely appearing in the data set. Is this it's a, yes, yeah, it's a rush recruiter. Yes. One more thing, even if the emendation to Shalaka is correct, I mean, Shalaka does not sound like a gold bar. I mean, Shalaka would be a splinter. Yeah. It's something pretty long and thin and usually pointed. It's, yeah. it's, it's not the way I would expect bullion to look. Yeah. Would you say wire? Uh, why I wouldn't expect bullion to look like that? Or I mean, is Shalaka, could you, if, if at all you had to translate Shalaka as a wire, could it be, instead of a bar, could it be wire? A wire? wire. Uh, well, uh, to me, it would suggest something rigid, and I mean, gold wire would be extremely pliable, I suppose. Uh, so, probably not. Okay. Anyway, it's not Shalaka, so we can forget about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the point was kind of to, to say our underlying data sets are not particularly robust in this regard. Uh, something the project is, is working towards solving, isn't it? <laughs> you yourself are, yes. <laughs> so, um, but so far, you know, garbage in, garbage out. I, um, absolutely. So we reenacting the exclusions of the archives, the old Foucauldian yeah. critique. So, uh, so next slide. So the question that we always need to ask ourselves: What is it we're counting? 
Right? We kind of had this point when we talked about Dale's data being Uttar Pradesh hordes, and the Kushan coins are there, but that's not where the Kushan coins are made. So what exactly should we read from their presence in, in one place? So what is it you're counting? Are you counting a region? Are you... Now, ideally, as a numismatist, what we would like to count are mints. We would like to look at each individual mint manufacturing center and say, what's happening here? Right? Do we have more coins from here, less coins from here? This overcomes a lot of our problems. Right? A lot of our problems are down to not comparing like with like. Right? It's all very well to say there's only 2,000 of these coins and there are 15,000 of those. But if there are 15,000 small copper coins and 2,000 large gold coins, right, then the 2,000 large gold coins are still a lot more money than the 15,000 copper. Now, neither Shaman nor Dale's account takes any regard for the size or denomination or metal content of the coins. It doesn't take into account the sort of context in which they appear. This group of coins gives you an opportunity to do that. Um, these are what are known as the central provinces type of the Gupta Empire, and they begin under Kumara, under Kumara Gupta, um, and the last Gupta emperor to issue them is Buddha Gupta. Right? Um, so essentially, right at the end of the empire, the empire collapses, Buddha Gupta's making this type of coins, and the Hun king, Toromana, makes virtually identical coins. Right? Uh, and then a whole group of kings, right? the Maukaris? Maukaris. Maukaris. Make them, and then we get some coins uh, associated with Harsha. Right? Uh, they don't have Harsha's name on them. Right? They say Shiladitya. Um, but the critical point about these is they're almost certainly made in the same place. Right? This is one mint, right? For the vast majority of these making coins, it was making coins <coughs> under the Guptas. It carried on making them under the Makaris, and it's making them under Harsha. So for 200, 250 years, this single mint is making coins. They're the same weight. They're equally ugly. <coughs> they, right? Most people, most people are not interested in collecting them. Look at the most recent catalog, type catalog of the Gupta coinage and see how little space is dedicated to these as against the gold coinage of the same empire. Like, they are not being systematically distorted relative to each other in the kinds of ways the other data is. Like, so, in principle, you could count these. Unfortunately, the only publication on these coins, uh, the, the post Gupta ones, is the publication of a single hoard in 1906 by Byrne, right? and that's it. Right? Um, so that's not enough data. Right? And one of the assumptions is that right, we just don't, that's it, that's all that's ever been found, and that maybe they were very, very rare. I'll just show you where they kind of fit in in the next slide. Um, so here they are, uh, Canage, here, this blue line. So because we know at the end they're almost certainly being issued at Canage, we can probably assume that's where they were being issued or very close by, right the way back to the beginning. Um, all of the other different series being issued in North India through the 6th century, shown as bars running down. Small dotted lines if they begin before the 6th century, small dotted lines if they continue. And this one here is a mint. Next slide. Unfortunately, most of them are not mints. Right? This is an abortive attempt to try and sort the present type catalogues of Alcon coinage into the mints which issued them. Right? Um, we have these amazing type catalogues. They delineate 500, 600 different types for the coins, right? but they haven't resolved the, the issue of which coins were issued in the same place. How many different mints? So the Alcons are not like with like with the Macauri coins because they're a whole 
conflation of different series. Are they one mint? Are they two mints? Are they half a dozen different mints under different polities? Very hard to compare. And just to illustrate again, Michael uh, said, you know, Michael said this is an old point that the way in which the archives form determines our interpretation of them, right? And those are affected by things that have nothing to do with the evidence. Right? I went back through the reports for Uttar Pradesh, right? And I discovered six hoards in the treasure trove reports of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, the 1906 hoard, which was found at the tower, uh, is not in the treasure trove. It wasn't treasure trove, so it doesn't appear in these UP hoards. But I found six hoards in those reports, which consisted of several hundred coins described as silver drama. Now, the interesting thing about those hoards is every time a group of coins that could be described as silver drama is found, but it's not one of these, so it's indo sasanian it's a Gadaya Paisa, the hordes correctly describe it as indo sasanian and Gadaya Paisa, they even correctly name Western Satrap. These six hordes are unique in being anonymous. And the only explanation I can think of, since they all cluster immediately around Kanaj, is that these hordes are in fact the same type of coins, the central provinces style coin. They rack up to about, I think, two and a half thousand coins, um, essentially unreported, because they're not making it from being found, being reported as treasure trove to appearing in the literature. They are anonymized in that process, right? Because when they pass through, somebody looks at them and goes, it's not worth giving any more information that these are silver dramas. Right? And so they disappear out of the... Uh, <coughs> so, dead horse, thoroughly beaten. Um, we'll move on to one of the ways in which we can skip ahead and say something about production. And this is the dye study. Uh, this is a sculpture from 10th century? It's, it's about there. It's, it's from a temple in Rajasthan, uh, and it was originally identified as a blacksmith at work, but that's very unlikely, um, given the arrangement. What was interpreted as a bellows on this side is probably a bag, right? And this is a mint producing coins, right? The person in the centre is swinging the hammer. The person on the left is holding the reverse die. This is the top die with a pair of tongs. So the die is a long column, probably made of bronze or iron, with the design, the reverse design of the coin on the bottom of it. The design of the front of the coin is on the anvil itself. You strike the top and it impresses the design into the coin. Um, and then you remove the coin and put it in the bag. Right? Um, it's useful to have a third person doing this. If you've ever done this, coins get stuck on the dice and you need to lever them off with a knife. So if you've got a third person around just flipping the coin off, that speeds the, the, the process up. <coughs> this matters because every single one of those dies has to be engraved by hand. Right? You literally etch into it at one-to-one -one scale, right? with a chisel to produce the design. Right? Uh, it's the kind of job, it's a bit like engraving a seal. Um, and that process, with the person there hitting with the hammer, it's quite violent. Um, it's violent enough that a French team who reconstructed this said that they were able to embed small silver coins into wooden posts nearby if they angled their dies right. Um, or wrong, as the sex might be. Um, <laughs> what you're seeing here are the people at the kind of front end of the mint actually generating the coin. They're doing it with these handmade dies and they're hitting the dies with a hammer and the dies break. So they have to replace them with new handmade dies. Which means we can connect every coin that is made to the two tools that produced it. And because there are two tools, one underneath and one above, 
When one breaks and it's replaced, we can form a chain connecting that back to the previous tool. We can say, this die was used with this die, and that die was used with this previous die, and so on back through a sequence. Um, die studies are the most powerful tool numismatists have available for studying coin production, because they literally lay out the process that these three people are engaged in for you to see. And they're quantifiable. If you want to make more coins, you have to make more dice. Okay? Now, there's some uncertainty in this. You, your coins have to be of roughly the same size. They have to be made of the same sort of metal. If you're making copper coins, you're going to break your dies much faster than if you're making gold coins. Uh, if you're making um, gold coins, you'll break them faster than if you're making silver coins. Um, if your coinage is large okay, uh, and the relief deep, you'll need more force. Your die will break quicker. So you can't compare coins that have different production procedures, but if the coins have the same production procedures, then the number of dies you used is a good indicator of how many coins you made. Okay? And if you have a really good die study, a really good die study, not the type I'm going to show you, um, then you can even detect changes in procedure, so you can even test for that possibility. Okay? And these kinds of die studies exist earlier in South Asian history and later than the period under study. But we also have a little bit of data from the 6th century. So three groups of coins. Um, <clears throat> the type at the top is an issue of Ranaditya, who was a king ruling in Sindh sometime early to mid 6th century um, AD. Uh, there, there's Sindh, marked on the left, in case anyone didn't know where it was. Uh, this is the one I said I would show you earlier. There are no examples of this coin in the British Museum. Right? We have no Rana Ditya coins. So people just weren't interested in coinage from that area. Um, the coin below uh, is... Is this a Yasha? Is this a Vigra? Yes. This is a Vigra. No, it's it's a Yasha. It's a Yasha. Okay. Right. Um, there you go. There's the difficulty of attribution played out in for you. Yes. <laughs> this is part of a group um, which has received the clumsy title, the DNNVY series. Right. Um, after the names of the kings who issued the coins. They're believed to be a small state somewhere in the Punjab who succeed to the Kidarites in that area and are ruling from the late 5th to the early 7th century. Joe has another opinion on who they are. Would you like to voice it now? We don't know who they are. Right. <laughs> the, the Kidarites are not in that area. Yeah. So one of those successes for the Kidarites doesn't make any sense. Because <laughs> they came after them. Because they came after them. No, because the Kidarites are further north. Yeah. So they can't be succeeding them. Uh, so this is part of the problem of unwrapping the political uh, element. And the coin at the very bottom is a coin from Samatata, imitating a Gupta type. This is part of a very long series of coins that we believe runs from about 500 to about 800 uh, AD. This coin's relatively early in the sequence, so it belongs sometime in the mid 6th century. So all of these coins are of the same date. <clears throat> and we have data for die studies for all of them. Okay. Um, now, the Ranaditya coins, I have a catalogue of, which I haven't published. I've seen 50 or so examples, it says on this slide. Uh, 55 examples from 37 dies. So based on the number of examples I've seen, the number of dies that we found, we can calculate how many dies were originally used, 113. If we know how long they're issued for, there we're having to guess, right? But Rana Ditya appears to be a single king, so we can guess any number that seems reasonable for a single king, depending on how we want to inflate or otherwise the numbers. We can generate a number of dies used per year. 
And so this is an index of the number of coins that were made. Okay. Um, Can you go over that again? Right, that's what I was waiting Where for anybody. Where's the number of dimes? Second, second column. Right, so the first column is how long on, the coins are issued for. Second column is the number of coins divided by the number of dies that have been found. We're talking about the obverse dies here, right? The die that appears on the anvil underneath the coin. That then gives you a prediction for the number of obverse dies that were originally used. 113. 113. And then you divide that by the number of years you would think they were made over to give you a number of dies employed each year which is an index for the number of coins that were being made. Right. Okay? So it's not quite a bit, actually. Yeah. So uh, the Punjab group, we don't have any die data for the 6th century, but for the coins that come in the 7th, uh, the person who just published a new examination in this group examined a small group of them and found 12 odd verses from 16 coins, Right? Now, what's really interesting about that is he concluded it was a very large series on the basis of that piece of information. Right? It's actually quite a small sample. I wouldn't put too much weight on it, but it actually implies it's quite small as a series issued over a long time. The number of dies is very, is very small. The Samatata coins, nobody's done a die study of these, but uh, no man and Bose... Uh, who just published a new catalogue of them, did, and this was what put me onto it, remark that they had seen virtually no dies, die duplicates, in all the coins that they had examined. So I ran through their catalogue and discovered that, certainly as far as the catalogue's concerned, yep, that appears to be the case. Right? There were only three die duplicates in the entire 116 coins that they image. Now, that might be slightly inflated because, of course, they're trying to show a couple of each type rather than multiple coins of the same king, so maybe they've excluded some that were actually die duplicates. But given that they themselves had already testified that they'd seen virtually no die duplicates, this seems to be broadly in keeping. Those are issued over a much, much longer period, so... Obviously, while the number of dies that we're estimating is enormous compared to Sindh, the actual number of dies per year isn't that large an increase. We need to go on to the next one, that's it. And we, we can convert this back into our production chart to give ourselves a visual indicator of size. And so on the left, you can see the scale of the Sindh Multan issues. On the right scale of the Samatata, and in case you're missing it, those are the Punjab issues there. So the Punjab issues are tiny, they're insignificant compared to. But what, uh, unfortunately, we have no data for the Kanauj issues, we have no data for the Eastern Ganges issues because I think we have like, what, one, two coins of the later, late, later Guptas? Yeah. yeah, so we don't have enough coins extant to do this. Um, we, we have a lot more refinement here than we do here. Here we can only look at the whole series as we go. Here I can break it down by the reigns of particular kings, um, which is a useful check as well that I haven't wildly misestimated 25 years for Barnaditia's reign because I've got preceding kings and his figures are broadly in keeping with them. The interesting thing about those is add all those back together and you're in the same order of magnitude as the Gupta issues right, from the same region. Right. So what's happened in this period is that you've had political fragmentation and political fragmentation has made the coins invisible. Right. Nobody studied. These are, these are literally, there are no type catalogues of the Sin Multan. When R.S. Sharma came, I think there were about three Samatata coins in the collection. And probably about 30 of the Punjab coins. And as you said, no Sin. Yeah. So, is, you know, so 
reading the British Museum collection as a record of production compared with that is just the, the two are completely different. And in, and in fact, sorry, it's worth saying, the, the second uh, of these seminars we had in the, in the project was, was the one I gave on, on sort of Gupta coins in general. Oh, yes. And in that, I demonstrated exactly the same thing for the transition from the Kushan to the Gupta period. That contrary to the graphs showing a fall, production actually rose an order of magnitude between, between the two empires. So it's the same pattern we're, we're seeing again. Once we can look at the production levels, they don't look like the number of extant coins. They, they don't look like the amount of coins that we actually have. So move on to the next thing. Uh, so back to the paucity argument. We've skipped over that first step in the paucity argument and gone to right, how many coins were actually made. So we been able to skip the first two and go straight to how many coins are actually being made. But that doesn't alter the fact that we, animal, that we looked at at the beginning, which is the next two steps don't follow. Right? Just because you're making a certain number of coins doesn't mean that the number of coins in circulation at the period they're made goes up or down. Right? And just because the number of coins in circulation goes up or down doesn't necessarily mean the amount of money available. So the die study gets us so far, right, and short circuits some of the problems, but it doesn't provide a, def a definitive answer to the question. Right? It's also worth saying that what I did there was to cheat by picking out the three series where I could actually do something interesting. As Shalendra suggested at the start, for the vast majority of coinages in the 6th century, we don't have die studies. We don't even have type catalogues. In most cases, we're in the same situation we are with the central provinces type, that we have one publication, right, often just on a hoard or a particular find. Um, that would be the case for nearly half the series I looked at in that survey, I think. Yes, I mean, another thing is that they are, you know, as I said in the beginning as well, they are not attributable coins. There are, there are coins, if you go to, say for example, go to um, uh, coin data in Rajasthan, uh, there are lots of indo sasanian type coins, and they are massive hoards, thousands of coins, 40,000, 50,000 coin numbers in the hoard, but they are not attributable. So collectors are not interested. Um, how many indo sasanian coins can one have in the collection if your example one is going to be sufficient for the entire series to be represented in your collection? You're not going to collect any more. So that, is, that bias is, is always there. They're not very beautiful either. Not so. You can only get one and be done with it. Yeah, if, if, if at all. If at all. If at all. And, and of course, that affects the, the scholarship. So one of the things that I thought I might do is that. Uh, no, no, we don't need to go on a slide yet. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I thought I might do is those uh, silver central provinces types, they're so perfect for measuring whether the production is going up and down because they have individual king's names, you can put them in order, you can date them fairly accurately, they're all of the same type. I thought, well, I can run through those, look to see if, if for the number of dies, right? but I can't because the museum, the British Museum was perfectly happy to have 12 of them, yeah. and Oxford was happy to have 15, right? And when, they pu when Burns published The Horde, he was happy to show 16 images, right? So of the two and a half thousand coins that are out there, I can see images of 30 of them, right? So I know there's a die link between some of them, but I don't know how many. Where are all these coins, then? Where are all these thousands? Uh, I mean, they are very well here as their if, if Robert's intention is right, and they are described as just dramas, and they are there of this type, then they should be in the state repository in, in London. So, right. In a bag, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a bag. Yeah. It's not too bad. It's not too I mean, it, 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 I would be very surprised if anybody has looked at them subsequently. I, I, that would be my assumption. They're literally sitting in a basement, in a bag, 
right? With nobody have I've, I've gone to an Indian museum and been shown a bag like this, where somebody's pulled it out and there's a carrier bag which is beginning to biodegrade, right? And they put it on a desk in front of me, and that's the carrier bag it arrived in the museum in, right? Um, so, and they've been like, you the know. Points, they're in well, they may have been distributed. There are, there is, there's always bunches of coins running up on the market, mm -hmm. as usual. Mm -hmm. So there was, in about early 90s, there was a horde of these coins. Yeah. And most yeah, of, uh, the, apart from the old ones, which, is, which are in the us or in the BM, uh, most of the later ones were acquired out of that, they turned up here in the market. Mm -hmm. And a bit of our stuff, um, our, our coins from that also came from a collection of indo Scythian coins which we acquired, uh, which was a collector series, and he probably has acquired from you know, from the same lockdown. Yeah, that's what they bought them from him. Yeah, there we are. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I mean, we, don't, the, we don't know where the coins are, but we do know that the tea is in the next room. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. I was about to ask, isn't this usually the point we break? <laughs> so, yeah, we'll break there and then. Um, I mean, just the just last uh, thing about before we go to tea is that what Robert did for those three little both blobs in, on Sin, Kashmir, and Samatata, you can obviously do these sort of that kind of analysis on other series. Mm -hmm. For example, a, a good example where there are lots of points available would be Wish to Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, there is, there is massive amount of data there, and you can, you can actually see dies uh, on. <coughs> but but the Vishnu Grimmins don't have a good type catalogue yet. No, there's not, not yeah, because they're only have one type. So there's no type. Vishnu Kundin type. Yeah. But but there are there are variations there are small yeah, are variations and they variations. might they, they look like they might be regional. That's yes. one of the arguments that's been put. So they're almost a group that... Uh, one of the things is, you can do a die study, but you often need somebody to have done the basic legwork of dividing them into types and recording the finds and publishing syllogies before you can do the die study. And they would do that, they would do that on the basis of pooling the information from lots of different isolated collections? Yes. yes. So that's what's happened with the Samatata. I could... The, the, the Ranaditya I had a catalogue of, but the Samatata... I could only do that because somebody had done a type catalogue, right, which was the product of several scholars and, a, yeah. and quite a bit of I work. I think we're into a lot of private collections and institutional collections as well. Yeah. So, so that is a type catalogue, so it's, yeah. Yeah. The, the die linkages are not very visible because they yeah. will only illustrate two coins. You know, yeah. the, one, yeah. one of those rulers I've seen 30 or 40 examples, um, whereas in the catalogue within two. So, so I think the, the resources are probably there to do more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody has to do it. So let's let's have the tea. Let's have the tea.